experiments in public management research. Um, uh, this is, uh, I should explain a little bit about my background, which might explain how I became sort of the vanguard of, of doing experimental work. It's, it's more because I, I, I'm, a, I'm a psychologist by training. I got my PhD in psychology, and I, and, I, and I got into public policy research because I began working for survey research firms in Washington, D.C., and I did a lot of program evaluations and survey research. So I had some early training as a psychologist in experimental design, which is a little different, I think, than most public policy PhDs who get more econometric kind of training or regression-based uh, uh, kind of approaches to using you know, more uh, economic or observational data. Um, so I, I, that, I, was I was always a little bit of a um, um, kind of, I didn't quite know what to do with that training, but I, I began to sort of um, apply experiments, actually doing survey research, because we, we were very interested in ways of asking questions about, I, I worked on some surveys of health behaviors in New York City, survey, surveys about public services and access to public services and policing and schools and that sort of thing. And the way you ask questions can influence kind of what people are, are, are willing to tell you and, and the quality of the answers you get. So the, the initial application of my experimental training to public policy kind of issues was in doing survey experiments to, to improve the way of, ways of measuring um, people's behavior and their attitudes and knowledge about government uh, services and programs. And then that morphed into more substantive use of experiments for other, other topics. And um, um, so, um, I'm, uh, let me see if I, I, I started, I've been at Rutgers University since 2008. Um, I started my academic career at, the, uh, at Baruch College in the School of Public Affairs there, where I ran a survey research center for about eight years, and then I, I came to Rutgers in 2008, and then the last, just about a year and a half ago, we started a center there for experimental and behavioral public administration. I co-direct that center with an uh, assistant professor, Sebastian Yilka, who's done a lot of uh, experiments and did a dissertation with experimental work. He was trained in, in um, Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and um, he and I co-direct this center. We're, we're, we're we have a couple of online subject pools, research panels that we use f to conduct experiments. We sponsor some events, but it's, it's, it's brand new. It's not a, a real center like this. <laughs> it's, it's more of a, a small group of people who do research uh, on this area. But we hope, we hope to kind of develop uh, a kind of a, a nucleus of uh, activity at Rutgers uh, on the use of experimental methods in public management and administration research. Um, uh, I'm also, uh, as um, Bill mentioned, um, editing a book with Oliver James at Exeter University and Sebastian Yilka, who's the co-director at, at Rutgers of, a center, of, our, of our center, uh, uh, entitled Experiments in Public Management Research. The idea of this edited volume is to kind of take, uh, take stock of what's been done. Uh, there's been a, a, I'll show you a graph, but there's been a surge of research uh, in um, public management and public administration journals that have used experiments in recent years. And, and we're, we're, um, we, tr we view this book as a way to kind of um, help um, um, uh, educate the field on the use of experimental methods, but also take stock of the work that's been done and, and assess it. There's strengths to it, but also limitations and weaknesses to it. And um, so that book is coming out in, in April. And um, it has, has a lot of uh, contributions from people who have been doing experiments in, in the public management and public administration journals. A lot of the work being done comes from Europe, and you know, the, um, probably many of you know there's a center of people at um, Aarhus University in, in Denmark that have been doing experimental work. Um, Copenhagen, University of Copenhagen, the Netherlands, uh, the UK are all fairly active in this area. Um, so it's, a, it's an international collection. Um, uh, in, in the book, we, have a, we, have a, we did a bit of a systematic review of the top 20 journals in Google Scholar that are in public policy and, and uh, public management. Public policy and administration, the top 20 journals, JPAR, PAR, public administration, um, 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 
and, and so on. Um, and we did a count of the articles that have used experimental methods in those journals. You can see that for many years, the, only a few journal articles involving experimental methods were, were published. And then beginning around 2010, it begins to, to increase quite a bit. And right now, uh, the most recent year we had data for was 2015. There are nearly 20 journal articles in the field that uh, have used experimental methods. And um, it's not that that trend's going to continue on that 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 uh, that slope or whatever, but it is it's in, it's increasing quite a bit, and and it's becoming a more major uh, alternative method uh, to to go along with some of the um, more traditional methods of both qualitative and quantitative research and public policy and administration. Um, it's part of a trend in a way that is across the social sciences. Um, Obviously, experimental psychology has been doing experiments with human behavior for a long, long time. But the rise of behavioral economics has been part of the influence that, that, that this trend in public management and public administration journals reflects. Uh, behavioral economics is really born from the crossover of you know, um, um, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman and others who who brought experimental methods and behavioral approaches to uh, economic decision making and economic uh, behavior. And that's really taken off and it's become widespread across the social sciences, but also even in, in, in society in general. People are more aware of the biases and heuristics kind of approach to uh, making sense of, the, of social behavior. And in political science, experimental methods have taken off also. There's a new journal of experimental political science. Um, and so I think in some ways, public management and public administration you know, are, are just riding the same wave of interest in experimental and behavioral approaches. Um, it also uh, shows up in government. Uh, there, uh, many of you know, of course, the work of uh, so the, the nudge unit, in, uh, the, the nudge approach to kind of uh, shaping uh, and improving public policy and public programs. So m much of that work traces back to the UK with something called the Behavioral Insights Team, which was a group of social scientists who worked in the cabinet office and, and worked on using behavioral approaches to improving government services and programs in the, in the UK. The Obama administration kind of borrowing on that model, launched the Social and Behavioral Sciences Initiative, <coughs> which uh, probably won't be around uh, any longer, but, um, but the, the, it, it did, did, a, did a, a number of really interesting projects and kind of spurred interest in it. There's been a new association form, Behavioral Science and Policy Association, which has a really interesting journal and, and continues kind of the work of that um, White House initiative and it's a, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, it's independent of the current administration, so it'll, it'll, it'll continue. Um, there are uh, various uh, centers, like at the Manpower Demonstration Research Corporation, they've got a Center of Applied Behavioral Science, which uses uh, experimental work to improve public programs by using sort of framing, cues, information, um, choice architecture, kind of the strategies to shape and influence how programs are um, taken up, how uh, people um, make decisions about uh, participation in government services. And, um, and some of this also is a reflection of earlier program evaluation work, which has always used experimental methods. There's a, no longer exists, but for a number of years, the Coalition, Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy uh, emphasized an experimental approach to uh, uh, public policy. So in some ways, this, this, this is nothing new. Uh, I, mean, I mean, those of you who have followed sort of the kind of the, hi the history of the evolution of program evaluation, there were early run experiments of the, like the negative income tax experiment in the 70s, the RAND health insurance experiment. There have been policy experiments that use randomized designs for a long time. But there is kind of a coalescing of, of influences now that I think is, is starting to shape uh, the academic uh, uh, journals that focus on public policy and management, which tend to have not included 
much of that experimental work in the past. Okay, so here's my overview. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why experiments matter in public management and administration, what some of the advantages are. And I'm going to give you a little sort of overview of what is experimentation, what are the key features and the core logic of the method. Because um, I, I, I would imagine, um, I mean, uh, um, I know you're, you all take methods courses, um, statistics courses, but, but I would guess that uh, probably most of you haven't had much training in actual experimental methods. So, um, I mean, that's changing now, and I know um, Bill and others here have an interest in experimental methods, but it's probably true across most public policy schools in the United States that they, generally students don't get training in experimental methods. Um, and so, um, so I want to go over a little bit of the core logic of it, because I think it's interesting to, to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the variations in design and setting of, of participants, and then I'm going to give some, exa uh, give some examples of experiments from my own research, just to kind of illustrate some of the, the work that I've done, so you can see what my work is like. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some extensions in the form of natural experiments and issues and limitations. So it's a, it's a lot to cover, but I think I'll be able to do it. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, why, why, why have experimental methods, or why, why, why this emphasis on experimental methods in, in uh, public policy and management journals? Uh, I think a lot of it, in some ways, stems from the limitations of observational studies. Observational studies, by the way, that, that term refers to data that's collected in surveys, administrative data, uh, economic data. It's observational, not in the sense of, you know, observing with binoculars or anything like that. It's observational in the sense that you don't, uh, it, it's, it's data that doesn't involve the manipulation of, of the independent variables of interest. You simply collect data on economic life, on social life, on schools, on school children, on um, survey data with lots of questions, and you just analyze the data um, in its, uh, as, as a record of the observation of naturally occurring behavior. But there have been a number of issues that have cropped up with observational studies, which tend to predominate in public policy management journals. One sometimes goes under the label of common source bias, basically the problem of endogeneity, knowing whether the independent variables you're looking at are truly uh, independent or whether they're caused by other variables that are also influencing the dependent variable, trying to tease out independent cause and effect is very difficult in, with a lot of observational data. And there's been a tendency to kind of rely on statistical modeling to handle that problem, um, but there are limitations in, in what can be accomplished with statistical modeling alone. Because um, some of it is just a, such a fundamental knot of, of causal connections that no matter what kind of analytical sophistication you bring to it, it, it can be difficult to tease out real cause and effect relationships. So, so that's this dissatisfaction with getting at true causal explanations. And the thing is, causal knowledge is really essential for public management and administration, because in many ways, it's a, it's a discipline about, it's a design science, in a sense, about finding out what works and how to make improvements by manipulating some variables in order to, to produce change in other variables. So it's, it's kind of interesting that the kind of causal knowledge that is especially important for public management problems is, is lacking in the primary methods that are often used. Um, okay, so just to give an example, I'm not naming names or pointing fingers, I don't even know who wrote this article, but this is a, uh, a diagram from a recent article in PA, the journal PA. Uh, my own work, kind of, I've done a lot of these sort of structural models and complex causal networks, but this is a typical kind of array of variables and relationships in a, in a public management study where the researchers are interested in the causal connection between variables that produce an outcome. In this case, a, a public service climate is the ultimate, the endpoint or the ultimate dependent variable. 
But these are very uh, difficult causal relationships to establish. It's hard to know what comes first. There's an order established in the model, but whether that really operates in the real world is, is unclear. And so, <coughs> so this is the kind of research that's, there's, there's a lot of it in the journals, but there's also kind of, I think, a, a, a fundamental sort of um, um, skepticism about what, what this kind of evidence shows, uh, whether, whether it really does enlighten us as to what causes uh, behavior or outcomes in, in, the, in the public and nonprofit sector. Um, here's another example of a table from a different article that looks at volunteering and volunteerism. It's the, the, the multivariate approach to trying to get at cause and effect by controlling for many of the kind of confounding uh, factors that might be um, um, at work in a, in a particular um, relationship. But this kind of thing, again, is sort of fraught with a lot of uncertainty. It's hard to know whether uh, implementing so many control variables is the right approach, whether you've got the right ones. You can make mistakes by adding in too many control variables. And just trying to get the modeling right is always a, a complicated thing. And, and, and again, you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to get at causal relationships. And, and this kind of modeling has certain limits. Now, on the other hand, it's not that experiments don't have limits either, so I'm, I'm gonna go to that, but I'm, I'm, because they, they have limits of a different kind. But in terms of proving cause and effect, um, this kind of modeling approach d does, does have uh, cer a certain amount of uncertainty and some limitations to it. So, so I think in, uh, other than the, you know, the broad trends in, in economics and political science, plus this kind of growing uneasiness with the, um, the nature of the causal evidence that's presented from surveys and other observational studies, has led to this uh, interest in experiments and this, this trend now of, pub of using experiments to address public management questions more. So I want to talk about what is an experiment, what distinguishes it. And in many ways, it's a distinction between watching things happen, which is what an observational study is, so surveys and administrative data, versus going into the world and trying to make something happen. And making things happen requires some kind of intervention, some kind of manipulation that's a planned a change in the world. And, you, and you, you try to make an outcome occur by manipulating an independent variable to see if it has an effect on a dependent variable. Um, so here, here's an illustration. So let's say we have a, of a survey uh, that we ask people, um, in which we ask people to rate the performance of government, and then we ask about their trust of government or public institutions, and we try to establish a causal relationship whether government performance is related to trust among the public. Um, that's an observational study because we're just asking people about the performance of government, we're asking people about trust, and we're um, um, looking essentially at the correlation of those two things. Right? And this can be done um, at an individual level, like with individual survey data, but of course a lot of studies in our field rely on aggregate data and kind of country level data, uh, state level data, county level data. But the same issue is there, for, and, and there have been published studies like this that have looked at the aggregate level of performance, like the World Bank has um, government uh, performance uh, measures, uh, quality of governance indicators. We could look at that at the country level. So that's, it's an independent source. Some, some of the research on, or some of the writings on common source bias kind of argue that the problem is in the source of the data. If you need two independent sources, but the same problem basically occurs even if you use data from two different sources, because if we, if we use World Bank data, let's say, to measure government performance, and we use World Value Survey data to measure trust or whatever, we'd have two different sources of data, but you still have the problem that it's an observational study, countries that have good government performance and high trust, it could be the other way around, maybe you need high trust in order to have good performance, maybe there's something common to those countries, they had, could have certain, you know, um, there may be, there are differences in, in sort of in history and culture that could be driving both the ability of government to perform well and, and the trust that people have in, in public institutions. 
So that, that, that's, that limitation of observational studies holds whether it's individual survey data or whether it's aggregate data, even if it comes from different sources. So what, I think sometimes the, the writing on common source bias pays a little too much attention to the source and not the fundamental problem, which is not having a truly exogenous kind of uh, a manipulation of, of the independent variable. So this is a, what experimental studies do. They involve an intervention or a manipulation that tries to change X in order to influence Y, and then um, that is sort of like the ping pong effect, I mean the billiard ball effect. If you can kind of make Y change by changing X, you've shown cause and effect. Um, this kind of evidence, when you're not manipulating X, is just relying on sort of the assumption that X may be ca causing Y. But in order to really demonstrate it, um, it's important to try to change X in order to manipulate Y. And so this, this is kind of the, the fundamental logic of it. Um, we, um, we do this all the time. Like in that, you know, it's a natural thing in human behavior. We, we try to influence, we, you know, we intervene in the world, we, we do things in order to make things happen, right? So we, you know, we water the plants in order to make them grow, or we, we change our eating habits in order to, to, to lose weight, or we uh, change our spending habits in order to, to save money, and so on. So, you know, it's, it's natural, a natural approach. We understand the basic logic of intervention at a, at a very fundamental level. It's very fundamental to human behavior and human ma kind of mastery of the, of the world in many ways is to experiment in a kind of informal way. So the logic isn't that, uh, isn't that different from ordinary life. Um, one thing that you can see though right away is that sometimes manipulating something like government performance is not easy. <laughs> so that's why experiments are done because you, you, can't, you can't manipulate government performance. Although I, I can tell you, this is what you can do. You can manipulate what you tell people about government performance. And that's sort of the, 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 both the strength and the weakness of experimental methods is they'll, they'll manipulate things in a kind of indirect way or artificial way or by priming people to think about government performance and seeing if that influences their trust. It involves strategies that try to manipulate, uh, that strategies that aim to manipulate things that can sometimes be hard to manipulate in, in, in real life. Um, so they, they can sometimes be kind of artificial, but uh, they can nevertheless get at real cause and effect relationships better. Okay, so, um, so that's the, the sort of the sine qua non of experiments, is this intervention in the world in order, in order to try to make things happen. And, um, and, uh, um, but it's important to realize that in modern experiments, intervention alone is not enough. So let me just show you why that is. <clears throat> so the basic setup is you have a condition, you intervene, and then you observe the, a change in the condition. Um, uh, so you could you know, have a garden, you could start watering the garden, and see what, see what happens. And, and that, that's a kind of intervention, and it's an attempt to make something happen. And it, it it's, provides good causal evidence of, 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 of a sort. Um, it's a bit like the commercials, right? Where the before and after commercials, you have a skin condition, you use the product, your, your skin condition goes away, right? Um, or there's this, uh, this one here, this is Obama. Uh, but, but before, before uh, his, his initial, uh, initial days in office, his later days in office, and you, um, almost with every president, they, they show this kind of before-after picture with the implication that being president caused the person to, to age, right? And this is, uh, that picture was taken before uh, he knew that Trump was re gonna replace him. So it's not, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not an emotional reaction to that. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's just uh, the passage of, uh, of the presidency. Now, um, but, he, but here's the problem. Uh, in any kind of before-after comparison, you, you don't know what would have happened uh, had Obama not been president, for example. Maybe he would, have, uh, he would have gotten older anyway. I mean, I looked younger when he was president, and now I look older, you know, and I was, didn't have the stress that he had, right? Um, 
And uh, same thing with the skincare product. Maybe this woman's skin got better on its own, right? Conditions change, things improve. Uh, sometimes if you just leave something alone, it'll change anyway, right? So you need to know what the, what's called the counterfactual. You need a, a sense of what would have happened if a different course of action would have been taken. This is also sometimes referred to as a potential outcomes way of thinking about things, but there's a condition, there's, a, there's an intervention to change the condition, the condition changes, but you also have to know what would have happened had the intervention not, not occurred. And that's referred to as the counterfactual. And in some ways a very fundamental definition of cause, causal effect is the difference between the factual situation, the observed change, minus the counterfactual, what would have happened had the intervention not been ap applied or implemented. But the problem is, how, how, do, you, how do you observe a counterfactual? So how, how would we observe Obama had he not been president, right? Or how, how would we observe the woman's skin if she had not taken the product, right? Because Obama can't be both president and not president at the same time. You, you, there's the factual is what really happened, and the counterfactual is what would have happened to his, his appearance if he had not been president. So, you know, one, one approach conceptually is a, 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 like a time machine. This is sort of ideally what you would want, right? You want to be able to kind of roll back the clock and rerun reality a second time with, without the intervention. So you, you, you could, you know, you know, change the way the Los Angeles Police Department patrols neighborhoods and see what happens, and then you could wind back the clock and, you know, not have that change and see what happens. So if you, if, you had, if you had a time machine, you wouldn't need experiments the way that we've set them up because you could have two realities at the same time and you could compare what happens. But of course we don't have those unless you guys are working on one here. <laughs> I saw all the telescopes and the science stuff there. So maybe somebody will invent a time machine. We can kind of tinker with public policy and, the, and by, by replaying, replaying uh, multiple, multiple futures. But we can't do that, so um, the solution is the randomized comparative experiment where you have a control group that represents the counterfactual. So the idea here is this is the, you know, you have a, you have a, a, a condition, you apply an intervention and you observe an outcome, but then you have another group that resembles the treatment group that you also observe, but you don't apply the treatment. The treatment is another word for the intervention. Treatment, intervention, manipulation, program, they're all what you do in the world to kind of make something happen. And the control group mimics what would have happened to the treatment group had it not gotten the, the treatment. Okay, so that's, that's the basic logic. So most, most experiments are, are comparative. Um, uh, most modern experiments are comparative. And they're, they're also um, comparative in a certain way in which random assignment is used, meaning the random, <coughs> random assignment of people into, or units, it could, could be classrooms, it could be neighborhoods, it could be whole institutions, are randomly assigned to either the treatment group or the control group. And random assignment has the, the advantage of providing statistical equivalence. It basically balances the, um, observations on all variables, observable variables, but also importantly, unobservable variables. And this is the big advantage it has over statistical control, uh, because statistical control only works on what you have data on, what you can observe, and there are many, many of the limitations of observational studies have to do with the fact that you, there could be important variables that you, you can't observe or you can't measure. Um, so this is the idea. I mean, the, the random assignment creates a, a treatment group and control group that are identical on all the kind of things you can observe, but they're also statistically identical on a, a bunch of things that you you might, you know, you can't you can observe or, or or you know on people's motivations, their psychological dispositions, their early childhood experiences. Their, you know, their their personalities, what they ate for, for breakfast that morning, any, anything that could influence the results, the random assignment equates the groups in a statistical sense. Equate equates the groups on both observed and unobserved uh, variables. So it's got that um, huge advantage. <coughs> 
So these are the basic elements of an experiment. You have an intervention or manipulation to change X in order to observe its influence on Y. In other words, they experiments try to make things happen. You have a control group to represent the counterfactual, what would have happened if X had not been changed. And then that control group is formed by random assignment, which guarantees statistical equivalence on both observed and unobserved variables. So th th those, those elements are the, the core strengths of, a, of an experiment. Um, and then that's the basic setup, but then there are many variations. Experiments can involve Sometimes only uh, pre, uh, post test only designs. There are certain things you can only, like studies that look at all cause mortality. Everybody's alive when they start the study, right? And then you can, you, so you don't have a pre test, you only have a post test. Um, some studies involve both a pre test and a post test. Some studies involve multiple pre test and multiple post tests. There's, there's variations on, in other words, in how frequently you measure the, the outcome variable both before and after the intervention. Uh, experiments can have multiple arms or, or, or conditions, so you don't have to just have one treatment group and one control group. You can have multiple treatment groups that have different versions of the treatment. Um, like I think the RAND health, insur health insurance experiment um, had something like 16 different versions of health insurance that were tested against a, a control group that was the, the usual uh, health insurance that people get. Um, experiments can involve multiple treatments at the same time, multiple factors, they're called. So you can test the effect of job training, job placement, and the combination of job training and job placement. You, know, you, can, you can separate the causal effect of one, the other, or, or, or both combined. Um, and then there are some other variations. There are some within subject studies, which are things that have to do with whether people in the control group can also shift to the treatment group and vice versa. So there are many, many varieties of experiments. Um, and, uh, and there are variations in settings. So there are laboratory experiments in kind of university laboratories typically, um, field experiments. Um, and often these laboratory experiments involve students as subjects. Uh, that's a very tr traditional model. There are field experiments in the real world with public policies and programs, um, and survey experiments where, where, the, where the experimental manipulation is embedded in the, in the, in the survey instrument. Now in, in, our, in our book about uh, where we take a look at the, the published literature, I'll just show you what we found in public management journals. Um, let's see. This is the, the frequency of the different types of studies that, experimental studies that have been published so far in the, in the public management, public policy and administration journals, I should say. That's what, how Google cl classifies it. But survey experiments predominate, and that's partly because there's been a lot of innovation in survey software these days, and it's much uh, easier to implement experiments than it used to be. And also there are online research panels, there's MTurk, there are, um, you know, Online surveys in general have expanded across the social sciences, but um, that's the most common kind of, uh, of experiment published in, in the journals. Um, but lab experiments are um, next, and field experiments are, um, 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 also fa fairly, fairly well published. And we, 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 if I'll talk a little bit about this later, but uh, uh, natural and quasi-experiments are a kind of extension of experimental logic that's um, uh, a little bit different, but we included them in this, this uh, categorization. Um, but in general, I think what, what might be true to say is that the field, given that public management and public administration are um, focused on the practice of public policy and the implementation of public policy, that more, more field experiments is probably, uh, should be uh, something to, to hope for because um, these are the kinds of experiments that actually test interventions in, in the real world and so they have a, a, a um, um, better uh, external validity, a bit better generalizability. Um, and so um, well, it would be interesting to keep, keep an eye on this because in some ways survey experiments have uh, 
have predominated, but they may not be the most appropriate type of experiment for looking at real public management issues. Um, and then there's variation in, the, in who participates in the experiments. Uh, students are a, a classic example. A lot of universities recruit students in subject pools to participate in experiments. But citizens, the general public, we can also survey broad populations. That's been done. Um, workers in organizations, managers, and even politicians. There's been, uh, there have been a number of studies that have looked at uh, political actors as well as managers in the public sector. Again, you're kind of looking at the literature that's been published to date in public policy and administration journals. Uh, most of the studies have involved citizens or students, which is a bit of, bit of a limitation, right? Because um, um, managers, won't, there are relatively few studies that have involved managers um, and some that are mixed. Um, I think one, one potential for the student samples is there are, some of the student samples are graduate students in public policy, M MPA students. A lot of those students are um, professionals anyway or about to be professionals. So in some ways they can be a pretty good proxy for public managers in, in, in society because in the, in the short, short run they'll, they'll take on those positions. So, um, but in other cases, the studies involve undergraduates, and then it's less clear how uh, useful those samples are. Okay, so now let, let me give you some uh, examples of experiments from my own work, some things that I've worked on. Um, I published a number of articles um, about a decade ago that were um, based on my survey work with New York City. I did a a number of surveys for the city of New York on people's attitudes and experiences with uh, public services in New York City. And I, that's observational data, survey data, and I tested this model from the business literature called the expectations disconfirmation model. Because I'm interested in sort of how subjective measures of government performance, how valid they are, and, and what kinds of biases crop into people's subjective ratings of government services. So I, I did the usual thing, which is do a kind of a structural model. This is the theoretical model, and this is the um, empirical model. So this is the kind of thing I was criticizing early on. Um, so this is, I've you know, learned from personal experience. So this is, uh, a, you know, the, the model basically shows that people's expectations, not just their experiences with the performance of government, shape their subjective evaluations. Um, I did that with New York City data. I then did a, a national study using an online sample where I replicated it. This is the same kind of model from the national study. Again, it looks at expectations influencing the satisfaction of people with government as well as performance. But what kind of bothered me about this was the thing I was talking about earlier, which is that I was never comfortable with whether I, I mean, it's very difficult to measure expectations. In a survey, in a cross-sectional survey, you've got to ask people to remember expectations in the past, and you've got to depend on their perceptions of performance, which themselves are rather complicated. Their satisfaction judgments might be influenced by their expectations or their expectations. Recall might be influenced by their satisfaction judgments. So it's, it's all very unclear. So. So one of, the first ex one of the first experiments I did was knowing that I had done these studies and I realized that I, they had these kinds of limitations to it. So I thought of an experiment to try to test this model where I manipulated expectations and I manipulated performance. So I'm going to show you how I did that. I published this in, in um, JPAM a, a few years ago. Um, so it's an experimental test of the same model. So what I did is I recruited about 1,000 people in an online, adults across the United States in an online panel, and I randomly assigned them into a low expectations, low performance arm, low expectations, high performance, high expectations, low performance, high expectations, high performance. That's a, a two by two factorial study. <clears throat> and it was a fairly simple experiment. What I did is I showed them this scenario, it's basically said, imagine yourself living in this town, read this 
You know, um, uh, recently the city's administrator made the following public statement about the current economic situation and the city's budget difficulties. This study was done around the time of the economic crisis. And in one condition, the basic gist of it is that people are told that the budget cuts and the economic crisis are, are probably going to worsen government services, so th things are going to get worse. And the other high expectations condition, it's basically sort of the same language, but it says that the budget cuts and the economic crisis will not affect the quality of government services. That the government will do all it can do to maintain the high quality of public services. So this is an attempt to basically manipulate people's expectations. And I, and I asked them, after reading this, I asked them, um, sorry, uh, what were your expectations? Now, you know, having, having read that statement, what are your expectations for government performance? And those who got the low expectations statement had lower expectations. And th those who read the high expectations statement had higher expectations. So this is called a manipulation check. I manipulated expectations and I just tested were, did, did the two groups really differ in their expectations and they did. And then I manipulated performance. What I sh did is I showed them two different pictures of street cleanliness in the city. These come from New York City's scorecard. New York City uses a system of scoring the cleanliness of streets. I picked a, a lower performance street and a higher performance street. These are actually not too different, but different enough that I didn't want to pick extreme differences in performance. But I just, so one group got only this photograph, one group got only that photograph, right? And then I asked them, what did they think about the performance of street cleanliness in the city? And of course, the ones who saw the dirtier street rated it lower, and the ones who saw the cleaner street rated it higher. So in this simple way, I manipulated both expectations and performance, and then I, I re-ran the model. So now this is exogenous, exogenously manipulated performance. That's exogenously manipulated expectations. I could kind of test the same path coefficients. Um, and, and, and things more or less paralleled the, the survey data, although this, this effect was stronger, and I had some discussions in the paper. The, ma the main point of this is to kind of show that uh, um, experiments can kind of be used to check on and, and try to replicate or test results that come from more survey-based analysis. Um, so that, that was an, an early experimental work I, I've, I've done. Now, I've, I've done a number of different topics, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I want to talk a little bit about some work I did on representative bureaucracy with Norma Rakuchi. She's my colleague at Rutgers, and she's done a lot of writing. She's more of a uh, qualitative uh, um, um, researcher who's done, um, she's done a lot of work on the intellectual history of public administration. She's done a lot of work on human resources management, the management, the federal workforce, issues of diversity and equity in, 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 in the federal government. And we were talking, we're good friends, we were talking, and, and I said, well, why don't we try doing an experiment with this representational uh, uh, bureaucracy idea, representative bureaucracy idea that, that um, we, had, we had been talking about through, through some other uh, means. And so we thought up some experiments. So here, here's what we did. Uh, well, a little bit about the theory. Uh, representative bureaucracy is an old theory in public administration. It goes way back to uh, 19, um, 1940s with Kingsley's work on the British Civil Service, and then Mosher uh, developed the idea, and Krislav has a book on, in 74 that it's, it's a very well theorized part of uh, public administration. There's d lots of different issues involved in this, but um, um, the basic idea is that the bureaucracy is in some ways more, almost more representative than the, than the legislative branch because it's a broader, more diverse part of the, of, of the government. It's a much larger part and includes different functions. There's ways in which the bureaucracy has, has more potential in some ways to represent the broader society in terms of skills and backgrounds and, and um, and also that there's some advantages to a representative bureaucracy in a democratic society that you want um, the people carrying out the duties of government to be reflective of the values and social origins of the broader society. Um, 
a bunch of empirical invest investigations have flown uh, have uh, flowed out of that, including a lot of work by Ken Meyer, who've look, who's looked at um, representative bureaucracy in, 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 in um, local government and in schools. Um, the basic idea here is whether a more representative bureaucracy achieves different outcomes, particularly for uh, um, underrepresented groups. And, um, but one of the questions is the, um, uh, the mechanism. How is it that if representative bureaucracy changes the outcomes for, uh, for um, underrepresented groups in society, if a more representative bureaucracy has better outcomes for underrepresented groups, what's the mechanism? And one me mechanism is active representation where the, 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 the bureaucrats actually act on, on behalf of, of underrepresented groups. But another possibility is symbolic representation, which means that citizens may respond differently to government if it's more representative. And there's been some observational studies, survey and, and administrative data work that has suggested that this, this, rep, this symbolic representation effect might be at, at work. And this is what we focus on in our experiment. Uh, so the, the basic idea is, for example, if you think of school children and, and girls in a science class, do they, and the, the science teacher could be a male or a female, right? And, and does, does it, um, and the, the female teacher may, may treat uh, girls in the classroom differently or more equitably than the male teacher? That could be a mechanism, let's say that if girls do better in science classes when the, when the teacher is female, that could be because the teacher treats the students differently and there's an active kind of representation, an active sort of effort on the part of the, the teacher to, to bring out the potential in, in girls in the class. Or it could be that the girls in the class see the teacher in a symbolic way as representing them being, identifying with the teacher and they try harder, they work harder, right? So, and they're not either or, both mechanisms could be at play, but, but we experimentally test the second mechanism, kind of the symbolic effect of, of that. So, so here's the active representation chain that the social origins of the, of, the, of, the, of the bureaucrats influences their values and their actions and that produces the policy outcome. But the alternative causal mechanism is that the social origins influence the trust and legitimacy that, that people have in, in, the, in the government agency. That influences their willingness to cooperate and that produces the outcomes, okay? Okay. So our first study, which came out in JPART, looked at representative bureaucracy and policing. Again, it's a fairly simple survey experiment. Does it increase perceived legitimacy? We presented people with information about a hypothetical domestic violence unit in, in a local police department. It handles uh, domestic violence crimes. It receives calls. It re uh, conducts investigations and makes a determination as to what action should be taken. Uh, the officials assigned to the DVU include, and we just varied this, nine males and one female, or four males and six females. And why did we pick those numbers? Well, nine and one is roughly 90% of police officers across the United States are male. That's about what that is. Uh, why four males and six females? Well, that's the slightly more female point. That's the point at which the agency becomes a little more female than male. So we didn't want to go to too, it, too much of an extreme that's about all that, uh, that we, we used to decide that. Um, then we looked at, according to recent assessments, uh, the DVU made a mandatory arrest of the batterer, and then we varied the performance of the agency. 30% of the cases or 70% of the cases where a mandatory arrest was carried out. That's because we had some <clears throat> initial hypotheses about the interaction between representativeness and performance. Like we thought people would feel more that the agency was doing better, that it was more trustworthy, that it was more legitimate. If it had a, a more gender balanced force, we thought that. But we also thought that if it performed well and it had a gender, gender balanced force, it would be seen as being even more trustworthy, more fair. But the short answer is that interaction effect didn't turn out, but the representative effect was strong. So when the agency was only nine, was nine males and only one female, we asked about the, fair, the perceived fairness of the agency, its trustworthiness, and its job performance. And they were all rated lower. Um, and this is males and females combined in the analysis. 
If you look at only females, it's an even larger effect. Um, and the agency was judged as more fair, more trustworthy, and doing a better job when it had a, 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 a higher percentage of females in it. So it was a very simple experiment, but it was our first you know, kind of attempt to look at whether changing the representativeness of the bureaucracy would influence how people perceive the agency and whether they trusted it or not. So we carried it out with another study, which just, just came out in PAR, um, where we looked at uh, representative bureaucracy and their willingness to co-produce. Again, it's gender representation. We, we've got some studies looking at racial representation in the pipeline, but we, I, don't, I don't have results for those now. But here's the, the way this experiment worked is we, um, we have a description of a recycling program, and we use a more subtle manipulation. We just change the first name of the public officials mentioned in the description. So this is based on a New York City recycling program. So it's either William or Linda Smith, John or Jane McGill as the mayor, uh, William or Linda Smith as the uh, um, sanitation commissioner, then later on, you know, Michael or Mary, um, and uh, where's the other one? Oh, George and Susan. <coughs> so that, so, um, so some people got all male names, some people got a mix of male and female names, and some people got all female names. Right? And then we said, this is a, a description of a recycling program. If this recycling program was operating in your city, how willing would you be to, to recycle? So we had three recycling questions, and they were sort of different degrees of difficulty of recycling. One is just throwing away plastic bottles, which is pretty easy. The other is like composting food waste, which is saving leftover food, and that's more difficult. Um, so here are the results. And now this is for females in the study, that the, the, more, the biggest effect was for the more difficult kind of recycling. So women reading this, this, this scenario, when it was all male names, about 46% of them were willing to recycle or highly willing to recycle. And then when it was all female names, that went up to about 60% that were highly willing to, to recycle. And with the, more, with the easier form of recycling, it, it, it's still a, a positive effect, but it's not as, not as strong an effect. Now, I, I don't have the chart, but for, for men, Men are less willing to recycle on everything. And so they're, they're, the, they're lower. And they're kind of flat with respect to the gender balance. Um, they're, they're not positive or negative. There's some indication that they're a little bit negative, but it wasn't statistically significant. So that, um, uh, okay, so that's, that's that. And I want to, um, I'm probably almost out of time, right? I should. What's that? Oh, really? Wow, you guys have. Okay, so. <coughs> no, okay, so, okay, let me quickly. So, I want to quickly talk about a natural experiment I did. So, the logic of experiments can be applied in, in non experimental data. I just want to show you this study because I kind of like it. It's the, a, a study I published on, the, on the, the change in job satisfaction in the federal work, or in, in, the, uh, in the public sector after the 9 11 terrorist attacks. And my hypothesis was this basically that the, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, this is the presidential approval rating before and after the terrorist attacks. So there's Congress and the president. Um, after the attacks, the approval rating shot up. So the, the, the public suddenly viewed the um, um, government institutions, the president and Congress, much more positively. And my hypothesis was that this kind of outpouring of positive uh, feelings about, the, the, uh, about government might, might influence the way government workers felt about their work. And also that the 9-11 attacks might have changed the, the meaning of public service in, in the sense that we, we were you know, in a national crisis, right? So I can talk a little bit more about the theory, but the basic gist of it is that uh, workers would actually be more, hap more satisfied with their job after the 9-11 attacks than before relative to the private sector. So I use the private sector as like a control group. And the, it turns out the general social survey has data on job satisfaction before and after the, the attack. So I used public sector, only full-time workers in the sample. I just screened out everybody else. Public sector workers, private sector workers, these are the sample sizes before the 9-11 attacks, after the 9-11 attacks. Um, 
And here's the, the, the descriptive results, right? So this is the mean job satisfaction. And you can see for the public sector, it shot up after 9-11. And this is the percent that are satisfied as opposed to dissatisfied. So in the private sector, it declined. In the public sector, it, it shot up. There was a recession after the, the terrorist attack. So it's, it's not by any means an, a, a randomized experiment. There's, public sector workers are not a statistically equivalent group compared to the uh, um, public sector workers. But you can see it still has the same kind of logic because there was an event, an exogenous event, that uh, presumably may have affected one group more than the other. And it bears it out. I mean, th these are the st statistics that show it. But the, pic the data, I mean, the, the results are in the pictures. And it's a significant, significant, significant effect. It's about a, f about a, a 5 to 10 percent. The confidence interval is 5 to 10 percentage points increase in the number of very satisfied or satisfied government workers, which is about a million government workers who are more satisfied um, or, or are satisfied with the jobs after the attack compared to the trend, the trend before the attack. Okay, so let me, let me just go to the issues and limitations. So experiments can contribute a lot, I think, to the theory and testing and, and theory testing and development, especially demonstrating cause and effect relationships. They have limitations. We can talk more about this. They're often artificial. They focus on things that can be manipulated. Not everything in the world can be manipulated. And there are ethical constraints. You can't, um, and the more you actually get involved with this, the more you realize there are, the ethics of experimenting are, are different because you're actually out in the world doing something. So you need people's permission or you need to do it in an ethical way. Um, observational studies remain important. Qualitative studies remain important. I don't think the field should be entirely experimental any more than it should be entirely regression analysis or it should be entirely qualitative or historical analysis. Um, so I, a mixed methods approach, I think, is often needed. You know, a combination of observational evidence, experimental evidence, and qualitative research, I think, is, is the best approach. Okay, so I'll stop there. So uh, the examples you gave are mostly sort of survey-based. Yeah. Have you done any interactive type of experiment? Yeah, not because of my background, as I, I told you. I, 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 come at, I came, came at this from survey experiments. And so I've, um, I haven't, I haven't, I, in my career I've done some, I've done some field experiments. I, I worked on an experiment of legal aid to tenants in housing court in New York City. I worked on a quasi experiment of uh, tenant management of public housing. I've, I've done some field type experiments, but, but most of my r recent work has been this, this kind of survey experiment. So. Since your research, it seems that your main method is give people a scenario and then how they judge some out, outcome, right? right. So it's, uh, since I was thinking about a lot of the common pool resource experiment is uh, an interactive platform yeah, yeah. to see how people were less or more likely to cooperate. Yeah, yeah. That would be a main research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, I, I just reviewed an article that was a uh, a kind of a lab experiment where they had small groups do negotiation games and they, they can, um, yeah, I mean, kind of observing group behavior or negotiations or interactions is kind of the game theory kind of approach is, is, another, is another part of the experimental methods, I know. But I haven't done that so much. So all of this is cognitive, right? So none of this is experiential. That is, people don't actually experience something. You're right. That's so experience is more likely to affect behavior than uh, experience and cognition than simple cognition. Is that, is that not true? Yeah, no, you, you, so the question of whether, yeah, like if you, like in the recycling example, right, where, where you, you ask people about their behavioral intentions, whether that really changes their real behavior, is is an important question, right? That, that's kind of the artificiality of this, and whether whether it would um, um, extend to actual recycling behavior. But you know, uh, I mean, my view is you've got to kind of start somewhere, right? So if if this 
If this representative bureaucracy effect can be demonstrated in a hypothetical kind of survey experiment, then maybe you could try some field experiments where you maybe make people aware of, you can't really manipulate who, who the public officials are, right? But you could make them aware if you have a, some diverse faces in the, in the public sector, you could, you could sort of make people aware of it by mailing things to them or something and see if that has an effect. Or you could use letters that are sent to people about recycling where you actually manipulate or, or, or use different officials, the, the real public officials, but change who writes the letter or something like that. I mean, you have to kind of think of ways to make it a field experiment. Yeah. So just on that, um, yeah, the psych literature was, psych field was critiqued for exactly this, done. Yeah. <laughs> experimental versus experiential. But then they started doing experiential experiments and they found basically the same relationships. Has there been, so my sense is that if you see it experiential, if you see it sort of notionally, mm -hmm. that's usually how it is experiential. Has mm -hmm. there been that study? Is there like a summary of that cross test that's been done? Yeah, like a kind of a meta-analysis that's been done of whether these hypothetical kind of, or behavioral intentions play out. I, I don't, don't, don't know of that. You know. But, I, I, but I do think it depends on, um, I mean, sometimes, sometimes the, co the cognitive stuff is, 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 is very important because you can't, you can't do certain behaviors unless you're, you change your thinking about it, right? So, um, but I, but I, uh, but I do agree. I mean, I think all, like, experimental work is no different than I think any other kind of research. Is you've got to, you've got to replicate it. You've got to extend it into different areas. See if it holds up. I mean, one one little experiment like this doesn't definitively prove anything than anything more than you know. In the in the field of medicine, they'll do they'll do multiple multiple clinical trials to see if if the causal effect is, is really there. And I think that's the same with our field. We're gonna have to do <coughs> multiple experimental studies, but also non-experimental studies to see if, if some of these findings you know, hold up or not, and under what conditions too. We have uh, several doctoral students here, but I was wondering if you might be able to comment on kind of potential pitfalls of, uh, you know, investing in experimental design, yeah. um, what your experience has been with reviewers. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So, so for doctoral students, I would say don't just do an experiment. Because <laughs> there, there, there's, there, I mean, I'm, I'm showing you the, the experiments that had findings, not the null findings, right? So I've done a number of experiments that have null findings. And if it's your dissertation and you're doing, and you put a lot of time, and you, and you run an experiment and you have null findings, which is not uncommon, I mean, and you can learn a lot from null findings. It's, if a well done experiment with null findings can be very important, but it's hard to write about. It's hard to write a couple hundred page dissertation about <laughs> null findings. So I, I have doctoral students who are doing experiments, but I always have them do a mix of methods. They do a survey and an experiment and some interviews, or they'll, you know, they'll do a combination of methods, both because I think that gives them better insight onto the actual research question, but also it means they, they're not putting all their eggs in one basket, you know, especially this basket, because <laughs> it's, it's a little risky. Because I've, I've worked on a number of, oh, it's even, like in Denmark, they're doing this very large study called the, the LEAP Project, which is a study of leadership transformational leadership, and if you can train leaders to be transformational leaders, and they have a control group and a treatment group, and they're training these leaders, and they're sending them back into the schools, and it's, you know, um, I don't know, it's over a million dollar project that Danish government doesn't seem to have the same limitations we have, and yeah. spending on money on social science, but they, <laughs> and, and I think, I mean, they have some findings, but not particularly strong findings, yeah. So they put all years of effort and millions of dollars into running these experiments. Well, yeah, you know, um, the Moving to Opportunity program, right? That massive 
field experiment on housing vouchers in the United States. I mean, there were some interesting results that came out of that, but there were also some clear null findings. And that, that's, and, and, but you have to be willing to take that risk. Um, same thing happens in medical studies. They run multi-million dollar, multi-year experiments and find nothing. You know? and so you got to be ready for that. And compared to observational data, in terms of the importance of research design, and um, because once it gets to a journal, right, I mean, you, you've run your experiment, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so the upfront investment in terms of research design, have you found uh, that you're taking, you know, a substantially more careful measures um, at that point before it gets to the journal where in a lot of observational data studies, right, that you can, oh, I can add another variable, right, right, I can add another control. Yeah, that is, that is a big difference, because with, with a, you know, if you have a, a good data set and you're doing regression analysis, if the reviewers come back, you can always rerun the analysis, include different cases, ch change the estimator you're using, use different variables. You, you, can, you can fix things. When you, when you do an experiment, it's, it's over and done with. You can do this, the, the analysis can be changed. You can look at subgroups. You can look at interaction effects. There's things that, that you can probe with an experiment, but yeah, much more, much more rides, much more rides on your initial decisions when you when you design the experiment. And some colleagues and I, and you've been a part of it, Bill, are are, are trying to organize a, a workshop at the Public Management Research Association uh, conference every year, where we we where we vet or kind of review experiments before they're conducted, so that we get kind of a, you present your experiment, uh, you you get feedback from colleagues before before you submit it. Or conduct it really, not. and there are some journals even that that are um, moving towards a, a policy, not not in public administration or public management, but in uh, political science and in economics, where they'll agree to accept the manuscript based on the design of the study of the experiment. So regardless of whether you get null findings or or not, they commit to publishing it based on the strength of the theory and the design as as a test of the theory. So, so you still have to do the study. You, know. <laughs> you can't just get it. But, but that, that, I think that kind of thing is, I think, uh, a difference with experimental work is the, the upfront decisions are much more critical. Can, can you talk a little bit about some many practical issues about putting the subject to do your experiments or what kind of mm. subject you usually use to do the work you do? Yeah. Well. So at, at Rutgers, we have two, we have two research panels, like uh, a, a general population panel that has about 10,000 people, but only about 1,000 or so participate in any one study. But we recruit them all across the United States. And they, it's a subject pool, but it's general adult citizens of the United States. And then we have a, a, another pool of public managers that we've recruited. And we, we're, we're trying to grow that panel. It's only about 1,000 right now. But, and only a couple hundred participate in any one study. But, um, so there are these online research panels which people use. The, they're student subject pools. Um, but they have the, limit, the limitations that we're, we're talking about. But, but it is a bit different. I mean, one, one trick when you're recruiting people for an experiment, one trick is how much to tell them about the experiment before you conduct it. Because that, I mean, you're supposed to be you know, it's, there's informed consent, so they need to kind of know what they're being asked to do. But there are limits to how much you can tell them about the intention of the experiment, because you don't want them to, to game it or to kind of um, strategize in their, in, their, in their response. And then there are some experiments that involve, you know, potentially deception. And that, that can be kind of ethically um, difficult. But the durability of these effects, right? So you're telling the story. And yeah, okay, I saw that, there's a, uh, that this organization is representative of me, right? And <coughs> therefore, I want to recycle or I want to co-produce with this organization. I say that right after I find this out, right? right. Am I going to think about this two months ahead of time? Am I going to think about this you know, four months ahead of time? And, and the difficulty in maintaining, uh, yeah, maintaining these effects. Right. Uh, is there is there a tendency within the experimental work to kind of overstate the effects? Yeah, no, I think that's that's definitely a consideration. I mean, there's one one thing. Uh, 
is that you can kind of view these experiments sometimes as I illustrating an effect that if the, st if the stimulus or whatever was repeated on a regular basis in your life, if that would shape your behavior. So in other words, if you had a more representative government, would the ongoing interactions you have with the government, if this effect can be demonstrated consistently in different settings, would that, you know what I mean, there, there, can, there could be a repetition of the exposure that, that can, any, any one exposure has a, has, a, has a short lifetime in terms of its, its effect. But then the question is whether the stimulus represents, or the treatment represents something that would be an ongoing feature of, of this, the person's experience. But if it's not, like maybe with this recycling, I don't know if it would be an ongoing experience that you know who, who's, who are the people that are leading the recycling effort. You probably wouldn't. So it kind of does come down to how you think of what it is you're demonstrating, whether you're demonstrating kind of, see I, I worked on a study with Oliver James where, where we looked at motivated reasoning, and we, we showed people information about the Affordable Care Act, and we, we either primed them to think politically, or we primed them to think about their need for health care. And when we primed them to think politically, the Republicans and the Democrats gravitated towards much different kind of opinions about the Affordable Care Act. When, when they were reminded about their own health care needs, like um, their worries or concerns about their own health, their viewpoints converged. And that was a one-time demonstration. We showed it, we primed them, and that was the effect. But our argument was that, well, we live in a polarized political culture, needless to say. <laughs> this was a study about a year ago before things got even worse. And, um, and that the ongoing politicization of, of something like the Affordable Care Act, the argument is that if we can show that in, in a, in a, in a one-shot experiment that priming people to think politically leads to this divergence, then in an ongoing uh, political culture where there is a lot of partisan um, priming kind of going on in the air, that people would do that in a long in a long term way, you know. But but whether I mean, but you don't have evidence of that. But that's sort of the um, a potential argument for it. Although it could well be that some of these things are just short term effects, and and that's it. That's all you're that's all you're demonstrating. Thanks for having me. <laughs>